Welcome back to the Inside Java podcast. My name is Chad Arimira, and my, do we have a special episode for you today that coincides with the Java 17 launch. Instead of the usual one guest, I have four guests today, each independently recorded to cover various aspects of this release. Kicking things off, I have Donald Smith to talk about changes to the LTS or long-term support model and Oracle JDK licensing changes as well. I think you'll really enjoy these announcements. I follow up Donald with Paul Sandoz on an update of Project Panama and the Incubator APIs as part of the 17 release. And then I've got Brian Getz, the Java language architect, on to talk about language features and how they all work together in harmony. And finally, the anchor is our very own Dr. Deprecator, AKA Stuart Marks, or maybe it's the other way around. I don't know, I can't keep track. He's here to talk about the process of deprecation and removal and how that process has been working smoothly going into Java 17. But before we jump into the episode, I wanna make one special announcement that we're launching a brand new Java developer website. The URL is dev.java. There's a ton of tutorials to help you up-level your skills, download Java, get a glimpse into the future of the platform, and there's even a Java playground that'll be coming just around the corner where you can try out the latest features right inside the browser. Check this all out today. We're super excited to announce dev.java. I've broken up the episode into two parts. Part one will be Donald and Paul. Part two will be Brian and Stuart. And with that, let's jump right in to part one. Donald, I finally got you on the podcast and it's an exciting topic. So. You know, first, why don't you tell the audience who you are, what you do, and why you are the authoritative source on all things Java? Uh, well, I don't know if I want to have that uh, that title, but yeah, thanks. So, I'm Donald Smith. Uh, I run uh, product management for the Java Platform Group at Oracle. My team is responsible for the product management e things related to Java SE, um, and of course the Java SE subscription from the product side. My team is responsible for our relationship with uh, OpenJDK and our stewardship uh, of that. And yeah, we work very closely with the architects who, who are working in OpenJDK on, on the Java platform, the new language features and, and so on and so forth. And I've been been here at Oracle doing that for about 10 years now. It's really incredible how much your team is able to do with such a small and mighty staff. It's pretty awesome. So thanks for that. Yeah, we, we do our best to, to uh, leverage up the work of the community and, and uh, all the different uh, groups within Oracle. And yeah, we're pretty proud of what we do. Speaking of what you do, we made some pretty exciting announcements today. This podcast will release on September 14th. Uh, some exciting changes to the LTS model or the long-term support and also licensing of the, of the Oracle JDK. So tell me about these changes. Yeah, sure. So, so let's look at the uh, LTS model first. For those of you that have been around the Java ecosystem for the 20 years or so, uh, you may recall with the first 20 years or so, um, we would do a major release uh, every two or three years or at least the goal would always start off being every two, maybe three years, but some, some of the major releases slipped quite a bit uh, beyond that. And so about five years ago, it became clear that modern application development really demanded uh, a different release cadence. And we looked at how, say, Ubuntu was managing uh, their release model and how Mozilla was, was transitioning to the release model for Firefox, where you had feature releases on, on a very predictable basis. Then you had long-term support releases, less often, that enterprises could, could adopt and then only focus on security, stability, and performance updates and make the risks associated with a new feature less of, less of a problem or, or less of an issue. As I said, it was about five years ago that uh, we started talking with other organizations in the Java ecosystem, uh, and there was a pretty um, strong consensus that having an LTS about every three years, but doing a feature release every six months made a lot of sense. And so after we got past the Java 9 release, 
um, which was kind of the last major release, if you will. We then got into the LTS model where Java 11 was the first LTS. Java 17, which is just released today, um, is the next LTS. Now it's been three years um, between Java 11 and Java 17, uh, which has given us a chance now to, to get a lot of feedback and also for the ecosystem to adapt to the new cadence. So, you know, when you have a 20 plus year old ecosystem that's used to consuming huge changes, but only uh, every three, four years or so, you know, organization structures, development processes, they get built around that, right? And, and so we knew that that transition was, was going to be, uh, was going to take some time, right? We knew that organizations looking at the six month cadence and trying to consume changes on a more periodic basis, as opposed to only every three years or so, um, that it was going to require some shift, some shifting. Um, and so with that in mind, and based on the feedback we, we've gotten, especially from developers who, uh, who work in more conservative organizations, they want to have more LTS releases to target their production applications to. And so we think two years makes a lot of sense. So we've gone through that first cycle. And now, based on the feedback we're receiving, we think it makes sense to do that on a two-year basis. So that's why we are targeting uh, Java 21 in 2023 uh, as the next LTS release. When you're starting to venture down the road of building a new application and you see an LTS just around the corner, uh, you're more encouraged to use the six month release cadence because you know by the time you finish that application and get ready to launch it, there'll be an LTS ready that your organization supports. So that's definitely, I think this is a really great change. Yeah, you know, the other thing is we started to see some, um, you know, so years ago there was a lot of stress to get a feature into a major release because you knew it might be a long time before the next major release. And we actually, it, it's funny, luck, luckily our development teams inside and outside of Oracle uh, and the architects of the Java platform, luckily they re they resisted this, but we did start to see some pressure to try to rush features into Java 17 because it was an LTS release, right? And it's like, no, sorry, but the, the release train model is six months, a feature goes in when it's ready. If we're a bit on the fence, having it as a preview feature or an incubator module, whatever, um, we'll we'll do that but we're, we're not timing features to releases um, and we're not gonna time features to LTS releases any, any, any more so. But, you know, it's like going to the two-year release cycle, I think will help with those folks that have the urge to do that, right? So where people have the urge to say, oh, please rush this feature in so that I can get it in, um, yeah, I, I think it'll be helpful to know at least they won't have to wait three years. They'll only have to wait two. Right. Yeah. And I think that because we've sort of flipped the model on its head and said, we no longer need to release things to get them in. There's another release just around the corner. The quality has gone up significantly. And because the quality has gone up significantly, the trust in a release on you know day zero or even the early access builds um, often are not even changing, you know, weeks prior to release. And so on day zero, you can trust the release of Java when it comes around. And you know that libraries and frameworks that you depend on have also been able to trust that release as well. And so there's this sort of galvanization around the new release cadence that we're definitely starting to see. Um, that's why I think this is the right time as well for these LTS changes. Yeah, the, the stability of the releases and the frequency at which a release candidate is the same binary that becomes the GA, uh, especially over the last few um, six month releases, is, it's, a, it's astounding. Uh, I think even our most wildly optimistic projections of, of where we would be in terms of the stability on the six month releases has been exceeded. So 
super happy about that. Awesome. So let's talk about the licensing changes then. Yeah. So for Oracle JDK 17 and later, so our future releases uh, will follow this model as well. Um, we're going to be providing the Oracle JDK under a free use Java license, and it will allow free use by anyone. Currently, we have, of course, Oracle Open JDK releases. Our six month releases are under, uh, we provide Oracle Open JDK uh, for every six month release. That's under the GPL, that's open source. Our previous releases, so Java, Java 8, Java 11, um, and all the way up to Java 16, uh, we also provide under an OTN license, the Oracle Technology Network license. And that license is free for personal use. So if you're just running a game or something on your desktop or, or laptop, that's fine. Or uh, it's free for development. And it's free, of course, with Oracle products. And there's there's a few other cases where it's free, Oracle Cloud and, and so on and so forth. But it's it's not free for commercial or production use, the, the OTN license. But starting with Oracle JDK 17 and later, we're going to be making uh, Oracle JDK binaries under a free use Java license, and it will be free for everyone. So whether you're using it for commercial use or not. And our goal is to make it available without a click-through license so that it can be easily downloaded and integrated into you know, modern uh, CI, CD pipelines and so on and so forth. That is pretty exciting news. We're happy to get back to that model when we when we transitioned to the new release cadence you know we thought that everybody would be happy with the oracle open jdk releases on the six month cycle uh, but the feedback was was pretty clear that people wanted the oracle jdk you know we want the oracle jdk please give us that we were committed to the licensing model that that we had launched with and so we're really happy that with this LTS, we're able to go back to making the Oracle JDK free for everyone as well. I think people are going to be very excited to, to hear about this. You mentioned that it's going to be free. How long is it going to be free for? Yep. So, you know, as, as I mentioned, um, you know, we were basically going back to, to an earlier model, except with, you know, with a, with a, a much clearer license without a click through. And we will make that we will make those releases available on a one year overlap as we had done in the past as well. So basically, Oracle JDK 17 will be under the free use Java license for a full year after the next LTS release. So enterprises that uh, want to get into into that cadence of transitioning um, from LTS to LTS can do so once again. Very cool. Anything else you want to add? I think that's it. Uh, other than maybe just, you know, to plug how awesome uh, your team is <laughs> and how, how, you know, for many years, uh, we were, we were very short on the bench in terms of uh, developer advocacy and, you know, ha having, uh, having a group that's front and center with developers and, internally advocating and pushing us in good directions, kind of like some of the stuff I, I just just noted. Um, so it's great, great to have your team and some of the amazing folks that uh, that you've brought on over the last year or two, especially. Thank you. Our job is pretty easy because there's so much cool stuff going on that it's like we, I don't know, I mean, speaking for myself, I wake up and I'm like, wow, like how can I tell the world the things that are going on in Java, yeah. Well, the you know the the successful transition we had a few years ago, um, you know, from kind of the legacy model with major releases and perpetual licensing and so on and so forth, to the current model with you know a subscription uh, that customers can buy just what they need for only as long as they need it um, at at a at a very clear price up front. You know, that model has been very successful. We have thousands and thousands of customers and and that has allowed us to, you know, continue to expand and innovate. And uh, man, the next five years, I'm really looking forward to. Yeah, me too. Uh, well, Donald, like I said at the beginning, I've, I've been excited to get you on the podcast, uh, you know, steal some of your time for the right topic. 
and uh, we finally found it. Um, and you know, like I do with every guest, I give you the opportunity to tell the world about a life in the day of Donald Smith. Wait, sorry, about a day in the life of Donald Smith. Yeah, well, um, I, I have uh, a team in, based in Europe. I have a team in California. Um, so I usually work nine to five, uh, which is 9 a.m. Central European time until 5 p.m. Pacific. <laughs> um, I'm based in uh, the east, eastern part of Canada, up, up in Ottawa. So yeah, so usually I, I, I get up in the morning and I, I work through emails and things that have been going on out of Europe and maybe some late breaking stuff out of APAC. And then uh, I usually take my mornings for myself because I know I'm going to be working pretty late. And a lot of my time is on email, sadly, phone calls, uh, a lot of reviewing of documents. So we have a, a strong marketing team that, that's been built up over the last three, three years or so as well. Uh, um, and so they're often pushing stuff my way that, that needs, needs some help. I have the, you know, the good fortune of getting pinged by, you know, folks like Brian and Mark and, um, you know, other folks and uh, other architects on the Java platform, uh, on occasion, picking my brain about various things like, you know, what I think, uh, would work with the various third parties working in OpenJDK, a fair bit of PowerPoint. Um, although I have to admit for the last probably four or even five years, I've been trying to have others, you know, be more front and center. I, I don't know why. I, I, I think just as I get a bit older, I, I mean, I used to spend a lot of time on the road and speaking at events and doing, doing the, the complete junket so to speak but i think as i get a bit older i'm i'm quite happy to let others do that and and fade a little bit into the background yeah i i don't know if that's the kind of thing you're looking for i'm curious what others might say when posed this question but i hope that was helpful what is your absolute favorite top beer of the moment <clears throat> so there's a brewer just north of toronto called badland they are my favorite brewer anywhere in the world right now. So my favorite beer is whatever the latest beer they are brewing. Now, when I'm in California, I love uh, field work. I am far, far behind on what's going on at field work. You know, they're world class. Can't wait to get back down there and, and have a few of their beers. Yeah, I, I hope to see you there soon. Okay, Donald, I appreciate it. Thank you for uh, spending the time. Anytime. Happy to chat. Thanks, Chad. Paul, welcome to the show. Thank you. Actually, I should say welcome back to the show. For those who didn't hear the other episode with you on Vector API, tell us about your role in the Java Platform Group. Well, I'm uh, privileged to be an architect in the Java Platform Group. And currently, my role is kind of dotting around various places that interest me. But primarily, I'm helping out on projects in, uh, uh, related to Project Panama. Um, technologies around there. So I'm, I'm helping out on the Vector API, but I'm by no means the only person on there. I'm helping out a little bit on the um, foreign memory and linker APIs with Panama as well, sort of skirting around the edges of that, looking at use cases and helping review the APIs and implementation. I'm also doing some other work that's currently sort of um, gestating internally that I can't talk about yet, but I'd love to talk about later if it ever reaches the point of that. Ah, well, our audience will be on pins and needles to hear that. <laughs> so that's a perfect segue. We are talking about Project Panama because there are a couple incubator APIs, first and second inc incubators as part of the Java 17 launch. Before we talk about those, let's talk about Panama. What is the aim of Panama for those who've missed the previous podcast episodes, and why should Java developers be excited about it? Right, so um, John John Rose, the uh, hotspot VM architect, amongst other roles he has, um, sort of envisioned Panama, as its name evokes, as a way of bridging the gap between worlds. And so we have the Java world, and we have the, the C world, or what we commonly refer to as the native world, in um, people writing um, applications or libraries in C. But there's also another world, which is the hardware world that we um, Intel instructions or ARM instructions, and we want to better bridge the gap 
between those worlds and give developers, advanced developers primarily, better libraries and tools to help bridge that gap. And then they build better libraries and applications from which other developers build on top of that and create this sort of sort of a hierarchy of enablement as we go up the stack. Uh, that, that's really the design here. We want to revisit um, um, the Java native interface and make that uh, a heck of a lot better than we currently do today. Uh, that's one of the aims of the sort of foreign memory and linker APIs of Panama. And then there's another area of Panama, which is the vector API, which is really around bridging to better hardware. So the, the foreign memory API and linker bridge better to the C world and the vector API bridges better to the hardware world leveraging things that called, we call vector hardware instructions, which effectively enables you to um, code data parallel algorithms explicitly. It's my understanding that a lot of code that lives out there for machine learning, data science types of applications are written in, in the C world. Yes. Um, is this something that makes that world much more accessible for Java developers? I, I think so as well. It's an enabling tool to build better abstractions on top of why, why rewrite fully TensorFlow when you can leverage TensorFlow. And effectively, that's what Python is an extremely good language at. It's effectively um, a very nice language for developers to come into, but it often bridges very nicely to the C world where a lot of the machine learning libraries, as you pointed out, are. We want to, we we want to enable that for Java and Panama is a very nice way to enable that bridge to the machine learning world, um, not just for TensorFlow, for Onyx runtime, um, and, and any of a bespoke um, library that a developer is using. So that brings us to JEP 412 and 414, a foreign function and memory uh, API and the vector API. So those are both incubator APIs uh, as part of Java 17. What's new and different in Java 17 from previous releases of those APIs? Okay, gosh, big topic here. <laughs> I think, um, you know, the, the taking the sort of foreign memory and linker APIs, first and foremost, that really Maurizio has been leading and done a fantastic job. This has been incubating since um, uh, Java 14. And I, what I'm observing is each round it goes through incubation, the API gets crisper and better and sharper, and the concepts have become more, more and more well-defined as we go and we get feedback from the community and feedback from us trying it ourselves. So we're reaching, reaching the point now, it's kind of a merge point in that the, the, the linker and memory APIs, which were previous JEPs, have now merged into one JEP and it's more uniform in its, in its concepts. In a sense, what's changed we got, we, um, there are two things I'd like to highlight that have changed here. One is, is a better concept of scoping access to memory and a better concept around allocating memory in terms of the memory API access. And then from the linker side, it's got, just got crisper in its design and its notions around how you model C types in Java, like C ints or C longs, and how you bridge that gap into the uh, making native method calls. So it's, it's generally got, I think, each iteration it's improved and got crisper. And there's going to be another round for JDA K8, and we haven't stopped. I'm seeing what's happening in terms of yet another simplification. We talk about it going to a lower energy state. And I think the API has become very compact and yet very powerful, combined with a, a tool which is external called JExtract. The developer productivity is, is, is incredible to inter integrating with the native world like this. So I hope we'll see a greater developer productivity through the combination of the APIs and the tooling that the rounds of it, um, rounds of incubation. As I said, we've got another round likely coming through, um, which will simplify it even further, but I think it's getting closer and closer to something we'd be comfortable supporting for the next decade. And that's what we're trying to aim for. Awesome. Yeah. And how about the vector API? So the Vector API is going through rounds of incubation as well in a similar in a similar style. So we, it, it, it's, I'd say that it's more focused and more advanced, um, more niche than the, the 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 Panama memory and linker APIs. Um, but it can, it, as an example, you can start writing machine learning algorithms using the Vector API directly, if if you so wanted to do so. Trade offs between going native and and, and doing this. 
And so what we've what we've done in 17 is um, Intel have contributed support for uh, vectorized transcendental functions, which means as a posh word for saying sine, cosine, square root, logarithmic uh, operations, which uh, give you a, a sort of a boost in performance and when you're doing algorithms, let's say like Black-Scholes, or if you're doing, um, I think in machine learning, you have a nonlinear function between your sort of uh, points in the neural network, you may want to apply data parallel algorithms for that. And so we've now got Intel architectures, the vector API will give you a boost for these, these kinds of functions. Uh, so that, I think that's one of the major uh, advancements in 17 for vector API, but we've also done a lot of improvements internally, optimizing the API and the operations. It's got a lot better since JDK 16. Right, right. And for those listening who, are interested in helping out with Project Panama, they're excited about it, they've been tracking some of the progress. What is it that uh, folks can do to help push Panama forward or how can end users try this out today? The way um, we sort of increase the reach of this is through the incubation mechanism and the preview mechanism. The idea is through incubation and JDK releases, you can get access to the APIs now and experiment with them. We don't promise anything in relation to production, but you can experiment with them now just by downloading the, the JDK. You don't have to build your own JDK from a, from a, a different repository under Open JDK community. You can, you can access these APIs and experiment with them and provide feedback through the Open JDK email lists. And I think that's working because it, it attracts attention. People come to the Panama list because of that. And then we can get them to try the latest builds and ask them to build cells from the tip of, uh, say, our own repositories. But the first and foremost touch point is to reach the broad community is providing these within JDK releases like um, 16 and now soon to be 17. There, and it, it allows people very easily to play with these APIs. Of course, they're, they're somewhat advanced, so it requires some investment from the developers, but we are getting, there are vast, clever developers out, vast number and clever developers out there who will play this and will do things that surprise us, always. Um, it's, it's a great feeling to get um, someone pushing the boundaries in ways we didn't quite expect and getting good results out from it. So I hope we can see more of that. And then for those who do try it out, how can they provide their feedback back to the, the uh, Panama team? It's to reach out to the Panama uh, developer list, uh, panama-dev at openjdk.java.net. That's the best way to reach out to Perfect. Us. And I will remind the audience that we have other episodes. Actually, we've done quite a few on Panama, which really shows the progress and how excited we are on the Java Platform Group for the progress of, of Panama. Paul, as always, thanks for your time. I really appreciate it. And this has been a great update. Yeah, thanks so much, Chad.